Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come to you because we recognize that so often we simply don't know what to do. Life can be so confusing. So many twists, so many turns, so many ups and downs, so many challenges, so many trials, so many temptations. Lord, at times we're conf confronted with hard choices. And part of us yearns to be as a little child and just to come to you and say, Daddy, just tell me what to do. Daddy, give me specific instructions. And then when we don't find that in the Bible, we want to get it some other way. And maybe we can have a vision or a dream and we hear people claiming angels coming down and giving them specific answers to questions of guidance. But Father, we recognize that those kinds of things have always produced cults and heresies and in the end have led people astray. That your spirit works in conjunction with your word and it is by your word that we discover the truth of how to live and what to believe. And Lord, as we come now to think through the distinctions between directives and directions. We ask that you would enable us to understand in a very profound way what it means to live as an adult child in your family. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. The message this evening, oh, we can do that at later on, hon, okay? No, take them with you, that'd be okay, babes. This is my beloved wife, and June 3rd we'll have 29 years of marital something. <laughs> Amen. Bless. Is Joel up there? You'll be able to do some scissor and paste. All right, let's go ahead and start again. Amen. 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 <laughs> First 29 of the hearts. <laughs> the message tonight is, is a tremendous burden upon my own heart. It is the last in our series of taking a look at the relationship between the Old and New Testaments. And it is meant to be very, very practical. And it touches upon the issue of how in the world do we live in this generation? How many times I've been confused? How many times I've just simply not known what to do? I have felt at loss saying, oh, Lord God, I don't know what to do particularly when you get into pastoring and you're dealing with people's lives and you're dealing with a marriage that is falling to pieces and, or you're dealing with gross iniquity from child abuse to rape. And, and sometimes you, you just simply say, Lord God, I, I don't have all the answers. Wouldn't it be neat if God were to drop down an encyclopedia of, oh, 100, 150 books, that the index would have a section on circumstances. And all you had to do was turn to the index and you could look up the circumstances or you could look up the sin or the situation, turn to the appropriate page, and God would tell you specifically what to say, what to do, how to act, how to react, how to deal with concrete situations. Now this is where religion comes into play. Religion has supplied hundreds of these books. This is why within Judaism today, they don't study the Bible. They study the Talmud, and the Talmud is built upon the Mishnah, and the Mishnah 
is built upon the Midrash. So you have the Midrash, then the Mishnah, then the Talmud. And there are two Talmuds, the Babylonian Talmud and the Jerusalem Talmud. And you're dealing with a whole shelf, two shelves of books. Why? Because the rabbis wanted to give written instruction to the Jews concerning the minutia of life. Modern rabbinic councils, such as in Jerusalem, have written rules. A question. If it's Shabbat, can I flush my toilet or is the pushing of the toilet lever work on the Holy Sabbat? The rabbinic council ruled to flush your toilet is work. Thus, a scientist developed an automatic flushing system on a timer so that it would regularly flush during the day on Shabbat so you wouldn't have to work. There were, uh, can you flick a light switch? Can you turn off the lights before you go to bed? Oi, that's working on the Sabbath. So you got to have the automatic timers. Can you cook? Well, if the oven turns on by itself, and the food cooks and the oven turns off, well, that's, God has done it. You didn't do the work. All you're going to do is eat. But what can you eat with that meat? What kind of silver? See, in other words, when you go into Judaism, you will be given many, many books that tell you specifically what to do. If you go into Islam, the Hadith, nine volumes, 6,000 pages. There's one volume that deals with the issue of how to go to the bathroom. Has a long section for men. Where do you point? In which direction do you let loose? How do you clean yourself? What hand? If you're squatting, what, which direction can you fit? All sorts of questions. For women, all sorts of questions. And if you fail to observe the proper rule, you can be punished severely. You go into Hinduism. Rules, rules. You can't do this, you can't do that. Do this, do that. Some of you are recognizing right now the Hindus are rioting around the world over McDonald's. See, McDonald's stopped using beef lard when they did their French fries. Then Julia Child and others said, well, it's lost all flavor because the French fries are no longer any different from what you would get at Burger King or some other place. Vegetable oil in the end is what? Vegetable oil. So what McDonald's did was to spray beef essence on the potatoes before they fried that. So you were frying beefy French fries. Now, the Hindus asked, since to eat a cow is to eat a holy cow, this does not have any beef in the oil. No, 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 it's vegetable oil. They just neglected to tell them that the French fries were sprayed with beef fat before they were put in there. So the Hindu was a rioting. Now, when you come to the New Testament, you don't find this kind of mentality. But the average Christian is so confused because when he reads the Old Testament, the believers in those days were given very specific directions. A believer said, Yahweh, how should I cut my hair? And an answer came from heaven that all barber shops had to obey. You may not cut the hair on the side, but you can cut it on the top. So the men ended up looking like an American Indian, a Native American, with these pigtails going all the way down that they had to curl up or put under hats. Someone asked, 
well, what about this or what about that? And they were given specific uh, directions how to go to the bathroom. You know, the Old Testament tells you how to go to the bathroom. It regulates the menstrual cycle of women. It tells a married couple when they may or may not have intimate relationships. You see, the, the old covenant had minutia. Minutia. Everything in life had to be according to the book, the regulations, and the rules. Now you read this stuff. As a Christian, you're reading this stuff. And then what is the response of a godly person? Well, how should I dress today? Should we keep those rules? It says I can't eat lobster. It says I can't eat pork. It says this. It says, uh, well, we're supposed to keep those? What about these festival days? What about all these rules, regulations, all of these laws? What are we supposed to do about that sort of thing? Well, this leads us to one of the most practical issues of the Christian life in which we are supposed to grow up and become men and women of God who no longer need specific directions. Instead, we're supposed to be mature enough to take a directive which refers to a principle and we apply it to all of life. The Bible from beginning to end states that there are moral absolutes that are true regardless of the age in which people live. Something was morally right or morally wrong in every single age and it doesn't matter what culture, what age, the who, what, when, where, does not apply to these rules. It was wrong to murder before Moses was born. It was wrong to murder after Moses. It does not matter where, what culture, without Moses, before Moses, with Moses, under Moses, after Moses. doesn't matter if you're in living in uh, Australia as a bushman. It was wrong to murder. Thus, morality in the Bible is supra temporal and supracultural, if you want to underline those two phrases. Supratemporal means these principles of morality transcend time. As a matter of fact, they were true before the universe was ever created. They're true now. And after the day of judgment and the wicked are already in hell and the righteous are on the new earth, they'll still be true. And it's supracultural in that we're not talking about something that is limited to a particular culture, be it Hebrew, be it Egyptian, be it Akkadian, Hittite, or whatever it is. It is something that transcends all cultures and civilizations. Now, you see, we live in a day and age in which this is heresy. The humanistic doctrine of relativism says there is no such thing as a supra-temporal and supra-cultural morality. Now, when I debate these kinds of people, the very first response is, well, you have just given us a supra-temporal and supra-cultural rule. When you say, absolutely true, there are no absolutes. You have just refuted yourself. You cannot escape the fact of a transcendent morality if you interpose your own transcendent morality to refute it. So it's useless. Now, we're going to make the distinction between directives and directions. I wanted to find a helium balloon. I couldn't fly, find one. But if I had one, I was going to, with the little string, let it go up here in the sanctuary. So you're looking at this balloon way up high, and on it was going to be written with the magic marker the word directives. 
A directive is a broad principle, underline that word, that is universal, underline or circle that word, in scope because it is an absolute, circle that word, it is not culturally limited, circle that, or situational in nature. It's like that balloon way up high. It is universal in scope because it applies to everyone in every situation, past, present, and future. It is absolute because it is the end of the road. You can't go behind it. That's the top of the pyramid. It is not culturally limited. It is not situational in nature. You never have to worry about whether or not you have to keep it. Well, in this situation, do we have to obey that? It's never limited by any situation at any time. It is so broad and so universal that it does not contain any particulars whatsoever. It's like a balloon that when you go inside of the balloon, there is nothing. Zero. All you have is the skin of the balloon, and when you look inside the balloon, you don't see anything. There are no little paper slips. You just find either hot air or helium or whatever it is. Because a directive does not tell us exactly how and in what way to obey it. It is thus abstract, circle that word. Moral absolutes are abstract because they have no specific or particular instructions on what to do with it, how to apply it. For example, I would hoist a balloon that says, love your neighbor. And we'd say, wow, that's great. Jesus said, you know, love your neighbor. You love yourself. That's a great, isn't that a moral principle? Yeah, love your neighbor. That goes as far back as Cain and Abel. Remember after Cain killed Abel and God confronted him, he says, what, am I my brother's keeper? The answer is yes. Your brother was your neighbor. Question, love your neighbor is a wonderful, broad, absolute principle. It's like a balloon way up high. But in and of itself, that command, love your neighbor, does it tell us when, where, how, how often, in what way, in what ways not to, it doesn't give us any particulars. I would lift another balloon that says, worship God. That's a wonderful moral absence, worship God. But does that tell us how to worship God? When, what time, what day, by what ceremonies? According to what rules? Are there right ways and wrong ways? Well, you see, just we say, worship call. Oh, that's wonderful. Doesn't tell us anything practical. Love your neighbor. Oh, that's wonderful. Now, this is why the Bible also gives us directions. And I was going to have the string from the balloon come down to the ground and the balloon is actually connected to the planet by a box that in the box are slips of paper that are practical directions how to do what the balloon tells you to do. Now directions are specific instructions how to fulfill a directive that has none. Now if you look at the chart, directives are universal, directions are particular. Directives are eternal. They're eternal. 
Directions are temporal. They are limited by time and by history. Directives are supracultural. It does not matter if you're a Russian, a Chinese, or a Hottentot. You're to worship God. But you see, directions are cultural. How to do that is cultural. Directives are transcendent. Directions are eminent. Now, this leads us to the unity of directives found throughout the 66 books of the Bible. We believe in the unity of directives, but the diversity of directions. There's no unity on directions. There's only unity on the directions directives. The unity between the Testaments has to do with these eternal moral imperatives that we call directives. What is considered moral under any covenant or during any dispensation is going to be moral any other covenant and any other discipline. What is moral is moral. What is immoral will always be immoral. Remember one Doiverdian trying to answer in my book, The Doiverdian Concept of the Word of God and the Cosmonomic Philosopher of Hermann Doivert and Vollenhoven. Only the Dutch tonight will appreciate it. So while I only sold 6,000 copies, and that was the end of it. Don Kuvelt. But this guy wanted to answer this issue on marriage. When I pointed out that Jesus said after the resurrection, referring to the eternal state, not heaven. Remember, we're coming back here. The earth shall be inherited by the meek. We're not, in, we're not meant to be flying around in heaven. We come back here. The meek shall inherit the earth to do work and labor and music and philosophy. And I said, there will be no marriage. And he said, yeah, because it'll be free sex. And he wanted to argue what was immoral now, a promiscuous life, a uh, sex life, would be okay in the eternal. I said, what is immoral, was immoral, is immoral, will always be immoral. You can have free sex. It's not in heaven anywhere. Talk about the earth. The unity has to come to the directives, the diversity to the directions. That is, when you read specific instructions given to Abraham, there are Christians who read what God said to Abraham, get up and move. Guess what they do? They move. Or they read in the book of Acts, they sold everything they had and put the money at the feet of the preachers. Worst mistake they could have ever made. And what do these Christians do? They sell everything they have and join a Christian commune where they hold everything in common. They're looking at directions. They go, oh, 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 Mr. Carter, I'm going to keep that too. Turn over to Deuteronomy 22.8 as a perfect example. As you read, the laws found, in this particular case, the Mosaic Covenant, though we could look at the specific directions given to Noah, given to Abraham. You could look at the specific directions given to individuals. But here we're in Deuteronomy uh, 22, Deuteronomos. All right. Verse 8, when you build a new house, you will build a wall around your roof. That is a very specific direction. When you're building a new house, you've got to put a wall around the edge of your roof. Isn't that specific? Isn't that found in God's Word? Now, if someone says, 
you've got to go back to the Old Testament and you've got to obey the law, the first thing you should do is ask, do you have a wall around the edge of your roof? I asked Gary North that. I asked Bonson that. I asked Rush Dooney. The answer was always no. And I always would drive by when I was in Texas. Where are the walls? It's very specific. Can any of you think of a passage in the New Testament that specifically says, you shall no longer have to build a wall around your roof. Was it ever explicitly abrogated? No. Well, you see, building a wall around the edge of your roof is a direction that is culturally limited to that particular time frame, and we're not supposed to be bothered with that. You see, the text goes on to explain that's a direction that actually flowed out of a directive so that you may not bring blood guilt on your house if anyone falls off your roof. See, they didn't have air conditioning. The rollout, the, the blackouts and the grayouts have become so significant they had to give up their air conditioning. You had to go up on the roof. The mama, the, everybody went on the roof to sleep at night under the stars. Does that sound neat to you? It was cool in the dead. That's when you got it cool. You don't want to be in any stuffy house. The heat was retained by those clay houses. You'd be on top. Now, if you didn't build a roof and little Johnny wanted to do his little thing in the middle of the night and he walked over to the edge, he might what? fall over and your kid die. Or you have a neighbor, someone in your house, think of sleepwalkers. If you didn't have a roof, they'd go right off and be killed. The directive, thou shalt not kill. So it's a balloon way up in the sky, thou shalt not kill. Doesn't tell us anything. Has no directions with it. We know there are times for capital punishment, there's times for war, there's self -de But that, see, that directive does, it says, you shall not kill. Well, that's great. The sanctity of life, that's great, but it doesn't tell us anything. Well, in that culture, at that time, the way that you would apply the directive is to build a wall on the edge of your roof. Now, today, we don't go live on our roofs. If you were to apply that directive today, you would put a fence around your swimming pool. The house that the Lord was pleased to give us, we got at a tremendous price. Part of it, the man's child, I think four years old, drowned in the pool. As a parent, I can only imagine the horror talking with people and having fun, and someone noticed, where's the baby? And they found him at the bottom of the pool. As a parent, I know that I want what? A fence around that pool so the neighbor's babies don't find their way in the pool. I don't want any, I don't want somebody's dog getting in that pool. So the directive, you gotta build a wall around your swimming pool there's no scripture for that, but it's a directive that follows the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. If you were so fa infatuated with the letter of the law, where is the only place you would put a wall? Your roof. But if you understand the spirit of the law, then you put it around your pool, or it means you have seat belts, or it means you take concern for the safety of others. If you're going to go hang gliding or you're going to do sports, if you're going to do uh, rock climbing, please tether yourself. Why? Less blood guiltiness comes upon you. So what you must understand, page three, 
and uh, you've got to circle this whole paragraph. The only commands in the Old Testament we must obey today are the moral directives. God never intended that Christians should be running around trying to obey all the directions given to the Jews in the Old Testament. You are supposed to see underneath the directions. That there is a directive, the directive is the artesian well that is bubbling up and what you see on the surface is a direction, but underneath there's a principle that you must find. A perfect example would be 1 Timothy. Would you please turn to 1 Timothy 5? Here the Apostle Paul is dealing with the issue that the elders who labor, and that's strenuous labor, in the word and in doctrine. So there must be expository preaching and topical or doctrinal preaching. That they are worthy of a salary. Look at verse 18, 1 Timothy 5 and verse 18. They should get a salary. Why? For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. You say, what? What is that verse? What, you're saying the preachers are like dumb oxes? Well, Luther thought so. But no, it's not talking about oxen. The issue is not the threshing of the wheat. Paul is saying there's a principle behind the direction concerning the animal. The principle applies today. It has nothing to do with oxen threshing out the wheat. Thus he could find inside of that direction a directive it is the directive that transfers over, not the direction. Let me repeat that. It is the directive that has been transferred from covenant to covenant, not the directions. That's why we don't have to do circumcision today. That's why we don't do Passover today. That's why we don't do animal sacrifices today. This insight reveals the fundamental error of all forms of legalism. There are those people who love to legislate other people's lives. It's a power play. They love to tell people how to dress, how to eat, where to go, where not to go. They get to the point, they tell you whom you may or may not marry, what job you can do, what you're to do with your money. They want, they're control freaks. And you find these legalists all over the place. In the cults, and I'm very sorry to say, in the visible church as well. Now they always run back to the Old Testament for directions because you're not going to find them in the New Testament. Show me a place in the New Testament that gives you specific directions how to cut your hair. Well, we have to go back to Moses. No, you don't, as a Christian, have to go for the Mosaic directions which were given to Israel. The whole reason the New Testament does not give us barbershop rules for beauticians is that the way you do your hair is a cultural thing that as long as it maintains a good testimony, it's perfectly fine. So we have guys who attend here who come in with ponytails. Maybe they're from the 60s. Other guys coming with crew cuts. Here's a guy with his hair slicked back. 
Do you really think your relationship to God depends on your do? Your hairdo is not going to determine your condition before God. The New Testament doesn't talk about that, does it? But a legalist will rush back to Leviticus 21.5. They'll rush back to the Old Testament for laws on clothing and food and hair. Whereas in Galatians 4, if you will turn there, and, and the antidote to legalism is found in the book of Galatians. The entire book is an, is a, is an apologetic work against people who were legalists and were trying to enslave others. That's why in chapter 5 and verse 1 in Galatians, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. And usually I ask the legalists, Christ set us free from what? Looking at you, he didn't set us free from anything. We're free. Liberty. Christ has set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of what? Slavery. He's going to talk about the old covenant that came from Moses as a yoke of slavery, as beggarly elements, as things that relate to the harsh teachings of a nanny that when the kid finally got 21 and he had his or her day of liberation, they were now legally free and no longer under the authority of the tutor, the child nurse. This is why in chapter 4 he said, Now I say as long as the heir is a child, he does not differ at all from a slave. That's why it's a yoke of slavery. Although he's owner of everything, but he's under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. So also we, while we were children, we were held in what? What's the word? Bondage. The Mosaic law is summed up by one word. Bondage. Slavery under the elementary things of the world. But Christ came and redeemed us, and that we are no longer children. We are now men and women of God standing fast in freedom. Thus you must understand those rules were given in the Old Testament. All those directions were given because the people of God had to progress in maturity until they reach the point that they could begin to make these decisions for themselves. Everyone who is a parent here knows exactly what I'm talking about. When your child is little, you say, now Bobby, this is how you comb your hair. Now Mary, this is how you wipe yourself. Your underwear shows you're not wiping yourself. You have to show your children how to blow their nose. You have to train them, give them direct. This is how you brush your teeth. Now, by the time that they're teenagers, they are already looking forward to the day when I don't have to do what you say. And when they march off to college, all you say, oh, God, please, may these kids brush their teeth shave, pluck the hairs, or do whatever. Lord, please may he wear underwear in case something happens. How many of you parents knew there was a day when your kids didn't want directions anymore? At that point, you hoped they got the directive, the principle. Now, when they came back with a beard, when they came back with clothing, maybe you wouldn't have chosen for them. You let it slide because you want your kids to mature and to make those kinds of decisions based on wisdom 
and you're hoping that all the years you put directions into them but preach directives that they'll get the point and when they go to college they don't become animals. Emotional immaturity, page four. And I know we have to go quickly. The book Snapping, if you ever want to read a book on why people join the cults, read a book entitled Snapping. It is a psychological profile of the kind of person who joins, the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, the Christadelphian, Scientology, uh, the Church of Christ, all these different, the Moonies, whoever they are, they are children who were never given directions and discipline. 99 times out of 100. Their parents did not discipline, they were not structured, they were never given the directives and the directions, and these kids grow up hungry for authority. And they come out of these baby boomer homes where the parents said, well, we want our children to decide for themselves on these issues. So these kids go off and join the cults, which then the cult leader tells them, this is the person you're going to marry and you're not allowed to have sex with that person for one year. And then you leave them and I will marry you to someone else. If you have children, we get the children, not you. This is when you eat, this is what you eat. And you're looking at these people from Harvard and Princeton and Yale and <gasps> University of California, and they're in cults that have legalistic structures or they're in churches that abuse that tell them when to go to the bathroom? You say, well, how? Because they are emotionally unstable, infantile, and immature. And you find adult in the church, adults in the church. I was standing behind a certain pastor in New Jersey, talking with uh, John MacArthur last week. I was amazed that he agreed with me. The guy's a tyrant. He thinks he's Moses. He's standing there. He had just preached on, Thou shalt keep the Sabbath day holy. So they love legalistic things, you say. And the guy in front of me said, Now, can I sleep on Sunday? Yes. Well, now, can I sleep out on a towel and get a suntan? No. Can I sleep on the sofa? Yes. Can I have the TV on? No. Can I take a bath? Yes. Can I go in my pool? No. And as I'm standing, I said, this is Moses. This guy thinks he's Moses. But what's disturbing is that here you have a grown man asking for permission if he can go in his own pool Sunday afternoon. Can I read the newspaper? No. Something is wrong. People who are mentally infantile and childish fall into this problem. Then I deal with those fringe groups, take the Covenanters. My book, Worship, It's Not Just Sunday Morning, will be out in a couple of months, World Publications. You've got people who say, we must follow the directions in the Old Testament for what we do in the church today. Thus, we will only sing the Psalms. To sing, oh, how I love Jesus, would be sin. To sing anything from the New Testament would be sin. He said, people, no, no, that's so Nazi. To yeah, I wrote a book against him called An Examination of the Exclusive Psalmody and became persona non grata Geneva College in a few places that teach this. What they are doing is this. They're trying to take the directions from the Old Testament 
and make you and me follow them today. Worship God is the wonderful balloon way up high, but it's an empty balloon. It doesn't say we're limited to the Psalms of David. We can have pews. you got these people looking in the... By what right do we have church Sunday night? And the old Puritan said, Ah, they had the evening sacrifices. And they went from the evening animal sacrifices to having church Sunday night. Then others said, I don't find pews in here. I don't find this. We're not supposed to have that kind of bondage. Quickly now. This is why Roman Catholicism is an easy religion. Those of you who were Roman Catholics, remember how easy it was? You were given a few basic rules. You kept it, it didn't matter if you were the most immoral person on the block. Long as you confessed it, stuck out your stung, the tongue, got the Eucharist, you're doing fine. No pastor should pretend to be a modern Moses. Instead, the point is this. If someone tells you that you must obey the directions of the Old Testament concerning worship or life in general, drive by their home and see if they have a fence on their roof. I've done it. Let's see if they uncurl the curls and they have these long braids like they were Indians. They never have them. It is sheer hypocrisy to talk about going to the Mosaic laws if you are not keeping all of them. It's either all of them or what? None of them. We are to keep the directives and we're supposed to be spiritual enough to understand how to apply it so you put a fence around your pool. You wear a seat belt. You put your dog on a leash. That's what it means to develop obedience and godliness today. This then is a harder rule than legalism. Legalism is easy. It, it gives you instructions. This view is very hard because it means you have to seek the Lord, apply the moral absolutes, and follow it. Father, we do pray that you would indeed liberate us from legalism in all of its forms. Forgive us for at times of failing to understand that we have to exercise maturity and thinking through the directives you have given us and then applying it to our culture, our situation, our generation today. And we pray, Father, that you will liberate us from all forms of legalism, its guilt and its power, that we might stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has set us free. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.